Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muckrick Podcast. I'm Jared J. Sexton. I'm here with Nick Houseman, by the way, who is ready for our election night show. He got a he got a sweet new haircut. I'm just going to go ahead and break the news. I did. I You know, it, it was needed to be done. I, I twirl my hair when it gets too long and it needs to be. Uh, I can't do that anymore. Well, he is ready. I am ready. Uh, tomorrow night, that is Tuesday, November 8th, election night, the midterm elections. A reminder, we are going to be broadcasting live at 8 p.m. Eastern along with democracy Uh We're going to have that on the YouTube channel and we will send out more information on that, links, all that good stuff. Plan on coming out. Um, this right here, this episode, which is going to come out on Tuesday, is going to be the official Muckrake Podcast midterm election preview show. Uh, Nick, can you can you feel the, the excitement, the lightning, if you will? Uh, if, if you want to call it that, um, okay. I, I don't. I, it doesn't feel like that. You know, now, let me just, you know, full disclosure, I did a three-day three day juice cleanse last week. I am now eating really clean. So I'm feeling really weird. I don't know if you've ever done this and feel strange. Like, I just feel like, you ever fasted for like 24 hours and you kind of have that? I almost have that feeling. Not that it's like starving hunger feeling. I just don't feel right. And so, and I haven't introduced red meat. I haven't introduced any kind of complex carb, or actually not the complex, the bread kind of carbohydrates. So I haven't done any of that. My body is like, what the fuck, man? And and on top of that, you're dealing with like uh, existential dread of uh, the political, socioeconomic situation. Uh, yes, among and then the list keeps going. But let's stop there. <laughs> it keeps going. So what we're going to do on this show, we're going to go through the major races. Um, when I say major races, listen, we're not going through house races. I we're political sickos. Uh, some could even say, based on the research and analysis we do and the focus we do, that we are sadomasochistic. We do not hate ourselves that much. Is that fair, Nick? Right. Well, because otherwise we have to be studying like Bobert's race and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene's race. And I don't think we could do that. Marjorie Taylor Greene's going to win her race. Lauren Bobert, man, would it be great if she lost? Oh, my God, would that be wonderful? I don't see it happening, but it would be great. Yeah. Listen, we don't wish ill on anybody, but that would be nice. Yeah. And, and I'll go ahead. And before we get into the, the Senate and the gubernatorial races, Nick, my feeling is that the Republicans are probably going to win the House. Um, and we can talk in a second about what the ramifications are of that. How do you how, how what's your initial feeling in terms of the house? Well, Nate, Nate Silver told me that's what's going to happen. Don't listen to Nate Silver. I OK, um, I don't feel good only because generally from in, in the anecdotal version of this, if the polls say that the Democrats are going to win by like two points, they're going to lose. They need to be up by like 10, 12 to make this actually work. And it's nothing scientific. So don't don't hold me on that. But that's how the feeling is. And uh, but there is some depressing numbers that I looked at from the Siena New York Times poll when you kind of pull out some of the other things that are not related to just the candidates that make you uh, really concerned. Yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about it, too. Um, there's a couple of things happening here. And listen, before we get into the analysis of this, I just want to go ahead and say we are living in a completely new political environment. Polls, schmoles, you name it, whatever. This is a weird, weird time. We've talked about it before. Historically, the sitting leading party loses seats, happens like clockwork. Also here, uh, Joe Biden currently is sitting on an approval rating around 40 percent. Those are not good conditions, uh, a bad economy, uh, you know, a, a bad situation all the way around with an approval rating hovering around 40 percent. It doesn't bode well. I'll just go ahead and say that if somehow or another things shift, we're going to be talking like on the weekend or about a brand new, completely unpredictable political model that is. And by the way, this is one thing that's going to be uh, um a reoccurring theme on this conversation, which is the links between different races and different figures, right? It it stands that if the party in power gains seats in the midterms, they're doing it on the coattails of the leader of the party. If this happens with Biden at about 40 percent, that's pretty amazing. You know what I mean? Like that's a brand new sort of an environment we got to talk about and what that means for the Democratic Party moving forward. But I am looking at the Republican Party uh, gaining control of the House of Representatives. Um, I also I and I, I sent you this link to this article on Axios, which was basically like a, a blind item talking about how Wall Street executives and so-called moderates were really excited about the possibility that the Republicans might not only take over control, but they, they needed to win overwhelmingly in the House in order to get past the debt ceiling. Um, that is one problem. It speaks to a larger uh, troubling uh, trajectory right now, Nick. 
But also another part of this is if the Republicans do win back the House, you've said it before yourself, it's going to be sheer hell for at least two years, if not more, because they are going to double down on absolutely destroying Biden's agenda and are more than willing to more or less sort of destroy the government, economy, society itself, if it means possibly retaking power. Do you agree? Uh, yes, but then there's also the benefits of getting some titillating, you know, tidbits from Hunter Biden's computer. That that yep. could be, for some people, might find that, you know, interesting. By um, the way, Nick, if you are tired of hearing about Hunter Biden's laptop, and mm -hmm. if the listeners are tired of hearing about Hunter Biden's laptop, if the Republicans gain control of the House of Representatives, like, go away. Go yeah. get a house in the woods because that is it's going to be 24 hours a day. Nothing but Hunter Biden laptop. And so. the guys, the guy filmed a lot. He's pro pro. What's the word? The word like more prolific, prolific. In, uh, in, uh, in 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 the in the documentation of his troubled life. It's uh, it's yeah. it's actually somewhat impressive. Let me just say one thing about the 40 percent approval rating for Biden. That's actually pretty good, I think, in this in these times that you're trying to we're trying to wrap our heads around. Where the other thing that we have to deal with is that the candidates don't matter. The character of the candidates don't matter. At some point, we should just have robots running, and we'll just vote for them because it's a rubber stamp. And I, certainly, the GOP doesn't care, right? They just want a rubber stamp for their agenda. I, I kind of think that the Democrats are moving that way too. Like it it doesn't it hasn't quite moved that all, all that way that way all the way because a guy like Al Franken would never have. Um, um, you know, uh, quit the Senate, you know, if we uh, truly just didn't care except for what the vote is going to be. But Al Franken, we know now, would never have done that in 2022. So this is where we're moving towards where it's it, like it's almost like some Elon Musk, you know, fever dream where it's just going to be robots running and we'll just, you know, rubber stamp our vote for them and they'll rubber stamp their votes for the policies. And then we'll have I don't know what that's called, a uh, crypto a technocracy. Government. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, Nick, I, I got to tell you, man, um, there is no better like lead in and segue into talking about like the major races that are going to define things. Uh, unfortunately, the Muckrake podcast, stamp it down. We are predicting that the Republican Party takes over the House. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. You're going to have the most bad shit election denying people possible. But what you just described, um, unfortunately, that technocracy is exactly what people like Peter Thiel are interested in creating, which is basically a sort of a techno feudal state in which, um, you know, you have like weird right wing, quote unquote, Marxism, socialist ideas, redistribution of wealth, particularly to white families, evangelical white families uh, controlled by technical elites. And the number one poster boy for that is none other than Blake Masters. So we're going to go out to Arizona, which, by the way, is where the crazy comes from now. It feels like that's like the gates of hell at this point is where that state sort of like sits. In. And, and by the way, I think Florida is a little bit jealous of that. You know what I mean? Like it's that's where the brains are getting nice and baked. But, but I don't know if I feel like any that they're any more crazy than anywhere else. Honestly, I, I'm in California and I don't think it's any more crazy than California because a California is so big that you can just going to find it. But like, you know what I mean? It doesn't. Well, I don't know if we can say that anymore. I just saw a little bit of state pride peek through and that was fun. That was enjoyable. It was like, don't tell me the California is out crazy. Yeah, but California, by the way, is moving to the right in so many different ways. And the crazy that used to be like California crazy is absolutely being co-opted by QAnon and election denying and you name it. It's really interesting you bring that up, though, because it feels like that's sort of a matrix, that sort of a, a, a of an ideology is sort of linking a lot of this stuff. And, and for what it's worth, this, you know, I'm not a rubber stamper for the Democratic uh, you know, Party. Uh, I went against Gavin Newsom's recommendation and voted for a proposition that will fund uh, more electric cars and Good. more charging stations uh, and based on the, on the backs of people who make $2 million or more. And if I ever get to that level, I'll be more than happy to subsidize those things, please. Well done, class traders. I yes, love it. But it was some so, sort of money grab by a Lyft, apparently. That that's what Gavin Newsom was calling it. I'm like, I don't care. Let those millionaires pay for it. There you go. So in Arizona, and listen, here's the thing, man. I, I got to tell you to go ahead and set the tone of this conversation and probably our coverage on Tuesday. I'm getting ready to say something that I'm really not happy that I'm saying. The race in Arizona has shifted. Uh, we have talked for the past couple of months about the fact that Blake Masters, who is an absolutely abhorrent candidate, like he, he's the kind of person that, like he'll put on a rally and it makes people physically uncomfortable because this is a repulsive person with a repulsive ideology. It seemed like he wrote Mark Kelly 
uh, was going to pull this thing off. It was going to be a pretty easy ride. Right now, the polls show that Mark Kelly has a slight, slight lead. It has shrunk. It has shrunk really, really in, in a major way. And I, my opinion of it, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, I think it has everything to do with Kerry Lake in the governor's race. And we'll talk more about that in a second and, and get into that race. But Blake Masters is now in contention to win the race in Arizona. I think Mark Kelly is going to win. But if we're talking on tomorrow night, Tuesday night, um, and, and Blake Masters isn't getting beaten by at least five points, and if this thing is too close to call all night, that worries me. And that says something about the tone and tenor of the country because Blake Masters is an abysmal candidate. By the way, I'll say that a couple times in this show, but he is in contention at this point. I think that says a lot about how the how uh, the the national scene has changed. Well, also don't forget, there's just an, a massive, massive amount of uh, early voting, right? And I got to check to see if Arizona lets them count it beforehand, but I don't think they do. So yep. remember, there's that delay, right, where all of a sudden Mark Kelly will be down by a lot, and then come back and back, and then that's when the Republicans start tearing their hair out and saying it's it's a fraud, but. Um, so I'm not, I don't know. I mean, the polls look like me right now. The New York Times, Siena poll, which whatever you can take these, all these polls are, at least this one has some methodology. Kelly's up by, what does it say? 5145. So yep. that's probably out of, without, you know, within, out of that's the margin. That's the outlier. That's the outlier. Okay. Yeah. So, so Kelly, yes. Kelly being up six is the outlier. Everything else shows him up one, two, or three. Okay. So either way, the, the bottom line is it's going to matter about like, you know, the pre, the early voting there uh, across the country. It's going to matter there. So uh, I, I do wonder if it's related to the fact that I've gotten, ha having never gotten an email from Mark Kelly, he's emailing me now a lot in the last couple of days. And I've never seen this before from him, from anybody really. All of a sudden my inbox is being flooded. So that is interesting, perhaps concerning. Well, you you know, and we talked about this on a previous episode, the Blake Masters campaign was in such a free fall that the Republican Party was like, we're done with any funding here. You know, Peter Thiel, take care of your boy. We're done. This is off the books. The fact that this is now a contested race, it says something about how things have shifted. No. I mean, this guy was a he was dead in the water. The fact that he could. And by the way, if he wins, that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. The Republicans take control over Congress. We really don't need to talk much else about anything else if this loser gets it. Uh, but yeah, it, the the fact that this campaign has come back to life, I think, says a lot. The silver lining or the, and I'm always looking for something that could be good out of all that would be, in theory, that it doesn't matter if you don't spend money. You yep. can still win a race. And if yep. we can ever get to that point, then hallelujah. I would love to get to a point in our political uh, you know, situation where we don't need to, where whoever spends the most money is guaranteed to win, which is kind of like what we've been happening for a long, long time. So, Well, and this would be, if Blake Masters pulls this off, it would be more or less a case of an oligarch funding an entire campaign, which is really troubling. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that is... That's like crossing a certain point in the road. That would be a real problem. So what is your what's your instinct when it comes to the Masters Kelly race at this point? I mean, I, I it feels to me like, again, I just refuse to believe a guy who is as bad of a candidate as that uh, can win. But the other problem is I'll say that about four or five other races in the Senate. Yes, yes. And we know that they're not all going to sweep Democrat, right? It's not going to happen that way. So someone yeah. is going to end up winning at least one of those races. And that's the problem here. And I, so I, but I, I feel like Arizona is safe. But the other problem is, is that they had a stronger um, governor candidate yeah. that might have helped buoy this a little bit better. And and I don't know if you want. Is that, was that a good enough segue? Uh. That's 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 the next thing we have to talk about. I want to say really quickly that if we look at a situation where the Republicans have control of the Senate and both Blake Masters and J.D. Vance have one Peter Thiel's little puppets dancing on strings, if the two of them win, that is a really bad scenario. Like that's 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 a real problem with that sort of block in the Senate, because that's the way national conservatism and you get them along with Cotton, you get them along with Howley. Like you start moving towards that direction. That's a problem. Well, let me ask you this really quickly, then. Does yeah. McConnell maintain control over the Senate if they have control? That's a hell of a question, because one of the things and we've talked about it on this show, there is a battle between the old small C conservative neoliberal Republican wing that McConnell. Rep I know it's so gross that McConnell represents having that power struggle. I mean, you're talking at least four, if not five or six senators coming together to form that wing. 
That's a great question, and I don't know where it leads. Well, uh, well and let me interrupt on that one, yep. uh, because McConnell could very well be, if he's in control, he would ultimately torpedo probably some of these um, impeachment proceedings. Uh, but if they get him out of there, then you can guarantee they're going to make a show trial and they're going to bring in witnesses. They'll do everything that they wouldn't do for frickin' Trump uh, and, and make it a complete mockery. So that's the other worry. Yeah, and here's the thing. We've talked about this on this podcast, like the fact that the Congress has, and, and even the presidency, presidency to a certain extent, has sort of been put on a leash, right, by, by the wealthy and the powerful. It, what they can do, what they can't do. This is a case where they wouldn't be on the leash. These people would it, – it, it's like an old um, Looney Tunes episode where it's like they've got a remote control. You know, that's that like where it's just like, oh, Blake Masters is in there? Oh, let me get out this remote control and see what we can do. You would see – and this is the, the real fear with national conservatism, Nick, is you're going to get like not only government corrupted, but government basically co-opted. You know what I mean? Like, and, and you'll get to see what actually happens when these people have control of the gears completely. But that brings us to the, I, I think, and this is why we started with Arizona, I think one of the more consequential races on Tuesday period, and that is the gubernatorial race in Arizona uh, between Democrat uh, Katie Hobbs and Republican uh, Carrie Lake. What I'm afraid of here, I, it looks like Carrie Lake is going to win this. Uh, Carrie Lake has been trending in, in an incredible direction, gaining a ton of steam. Everybody's showing Carrie between three to six points ahead. There's barely any sort of like recommendation of Hobbs being ahead. Um, it does feel like the momentum has moved towards Lake. We're not just talking about the 2022 midterms now. We're talking about 2024 and moving forward. We're talking about somebody at the gears who is an election denier and has already basically said they're willing to overturn a presidential election. It's it's a really concerning race for me. And and, and the, the, the coupling of that is the secretary of state, which looks like it will be won by the Democrat, which sets up all sorts of interesting dilemmas here because you're going to have a, maybe a potential governor trying to override an election with a potential you know Democrat uh, secretary of state who's trying to keep the election but clean. Nick, luckily there aren't like armed paramilitary groups like intimidating no. election officials in Arizona, right? No, that would never happen. Oh, OK, that's cool. The judges okay, would good. never let that happen. That's great. That's good. So, but Carrie Lake's interesting. Again, if you if you wanted to become a, a, a politician in these days, you you're on, you get on TV or become a social media star and and ride that wave. This is what she did as an anchor, and uh, she's much more glamorous than her opponent. Yes. And again, I, I used to say this before: like, just put a picture up of the candidate and the name. That's it. Don't let them speak because they're going to lie, right? That, that used to be what I said back in the day before before we're at where we are now. Um, and this whole robot thing where we're just going to vote for rubber stamps, like this is sort of what we have to do. And she wanted to win. She clearly, she pivoted so completely. She was a relatively progressive. Yes. Yes. And she so, was a liberal. Yes. So, so completely pivoted as a cynical power grab. Um, but then again, those, that's the rules. The rules dictate you want to win and you're going to run Republican because there's an opening. This is These are exactly the things you have to do and say. And uh, as long as you don't care about that, you know, and you might not even govern that way. You yes. need to say the things. But I got to tell you, you say them enough times. Right. You, you kind of get held to those things. You're going to have to govern that way. Carrie Lake is a rising star in Republican politics. Um, and that's a really concerning thing. She's very good at this. She actually really is. It's the TV. It's it's the TV and her ability to sort of dance around. Uh, we've talked about this with Tucker, right? And Tucker went completely over the, <laughs> like, you know, ass end over teacup. In this case, Carrie Lake is very, very good, very polished in, in terms of, like, communicating this stuff. Um, I, I, I have to tell you, the rumors, of course, have been that Trump is going to announce his candidacy and is immediately going to be with Marjorie Taylor Greene. My God, um, Trump and Carrie Lake, I mean, that that really is... Um, that that's a match made in hell. This is her and audition, isn't it? This is her audition. Yes. And the question at this point is whether or not she can win convincingly and then do what the MAGA world wants her to do. Um, and, and I got to tell you, this is you're exactly right. It's it's her audition. And here's the thing about this is that she might not, she might have calculated, you know what? It wouldn't be worth selling my soul to run for governor of Arizona to do this. But 
But if I win, I could become vice president. I can become fucking the first woman president in the United States. Now that, I mean, listen, it would be enough to, as governor to sell your soul, I would imagine. But still, there's no question that was a calculation on her part, right? And, uh, yeah, I, you know, she's a freaking Karen. I can't believe a Karen is going to be able to get into this, uh, win this race when we, you know, people make fun of people like this all the time. But, man, uh, here we are. So I, I will go ahead. I, I think Terry Lake is going to win this. I think that's going to suck. I'm not looking forward to it, but I do think, and, and by the way, we'll go, the next state works the exact same way. I will say that a lot of what happens in Arizona is going to be determined on whether or not Carrie Lake's coattails mm -hmm. brings along Blake Masters. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and by the way, and maybe people mistake Carrie for Katie and then vote the wrong for Katie instead. <laughs> maybe let's hope so. But, but I do, I, I think that's the thing is it's really going to depend on whether or not she can drag Blake Masters absolutely um, disgusting corpse over the line. Well, let me ask you this real quickly about this race, because Katie Hobbs refused to debate Carrie Lake. Yep. And she kind of was saying it was because she didn't want to give a voice to such outrageous MAGA lies. Yep. Um, th th that's noble. But is, was this a mistake in your point in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. You get on the stage and you debate every single time. I, I, you go after them and especially and I'm sorry but if you're a Democrat you have to because the knock against you if you're a Democrat is that you're weak mm -hmm. every time go on the stage and knock their ass around right. well, I, that's the only thing you can do let's just narrator's voice uh, they're going to call them weak anyway but yeah. uh, <laughs> right. Right. But, right. but like I, maybe Katie isn't a good debater like I can't quite figure out the calculation there on her camp like why they, they made that decision because it can't possibly be oh we don't want her to spread lies on a, on a bigger platform right That's she right. must something is going on there and i don't know what it is but you know in this poll i'm looking at for new york times sienna it, it is tied you know i'm sure it's a bit of an outlier too but uh you never know crazy things could happen tomorrow i'll tell you what if katie hobbs pulls out an upset over carrie lake then all of a sudden we're talking about a completely different election. I, I that's, that's one of the things. I, and that's why we're talking about Arizona. I think Arizona is going to be a big bellwether here. Speaking of, we got to go to my stomping grounds, Georgia. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with the gubernatorial race because that that is uh, pretty telling here. Of course, we got the incumbent, Brian Kemp, who basically stole the election in 2016, running against Stacey Abrams. Um, I, listen, I, I don't know how to tell everybody this. Brian Kemp is going to beat Stacey Abrams. Yeah. That's done. The cake is baked. Um, Abrams is not going to be the governor of Georgia this time around. I don't know if ever. Um, there's a lot of things that have happened here. We can get into the analysis of it. The question in Georgia is this. How much is Kemp going to win by? And is he going to bring Herschel Walker along with him? But before we get into the Senate race, I mean, I, I think you agree with me about Kemp over over uh, Stacey here, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even this poll I'm looking at is she's down by five. I mean, here, here when you break it out into like even gender, for instance, not that like every woman would vote for a woman candidate, but she didn't even get um, you know half the half of the uh, women electorate to to yep. commit to her, and that that's a I mean. I don't know what's happening in Georgia, but that that's a, a telling. Do sign. you do you have a couple hours? I mean, we could like start to get into it. Uh, I mean, well, I do want to talk. I guess you, you talk about race and ethnicity, I suppose. Well, um, it's a lot of that, man. It's Georgia, and and I know that everybody always thinks about the South as sort of like um you know a, like a like homogenous zone. Everybody's of the same mind. The South is very different. The mm -hmm. the South, depending upon where you go, what you're looking at, very very different. And Georgia is what you would always call the most forward facing state in the South. They want to believe that they're, you know, uh, tolerant. They want to believe that they're progressive and that they're more cosmopolitan, except for, you know, the more rural parts. Um, when it comes to this situation, they really want to believe that they are a purple state. Like it's actually baked into the identity of Georgia as is right now, but they don't want to reckon with the larger parts. When they talk about somebody like Stacey Abrams, they think, mass change, redistribution, racial politics. That's what they say. That's what Warnock has been able to push aside, right? And, 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 and it's actually shown a pretty incredible talent for it. Stacey Abrams' campaign has never gained its footing this time around. There are multiple reasons for that. One is that she publicly auditioned for the vice presidency. She, bas she said out loud, you're not supposed to do it. You're not supposed to say, I want it. Second of all, and I know people are going to roll their eyes, her uh, cameo on that Star Trek show as president of the Earth was one of the worst cultural uh, pop culture mistakes I've seen in politics in a very long time. It it 
fed into every narrative of her, which is she's not running to be your governor. She's running to be the president later. And it went into everything that they thought. They're very concerned about, quote unquote, crime. Right. And they 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 like where things are going uh, economically. They like the corporations uh, that are using Georgia, particularly from your neck of the woods, California. It's become the California of the East. Uh, they don't want to upset that boat. And Brian Kemp has been able to. And by the way, oh, my God, it makes me sick, Nick. Oh, God. Oh, it hurts my stomach so bad while I'm getting ready to say, are you ready? I'm ready. He's not a talented politician, but he look, he's done a good job of straddling MAGA and moderate, quote unquote, Republicanism. Ugh. I'm sorry. You, you got to talk for a minute. I got to right. recover. Yeah, yeah, rinse your mouth out a little bit. Um, yeah, no. he, he, um, he's been quiet. And it's kind of representative of uh, the Walker and Warnock race because it, I don't know if you ever watched uh, you know, Trump's show, uh, The Apprentice. Francis. Uh, but a lot of times when people start to fail on the show and they're, start, they're, gonna, they're really doing badly, the people who are competing against them shut up. Don't yep. say anything. Let, let him this do guy, it. Yeah, let, let him, him do, do it. it. And this is what's happening certainly in, in, the, in the Warnock race with Herschel Walker. And that's why it seems to me like Warnock's going to win. And Kemp is, is sort of straddling that in the same way where he's just kind of quiet. He hasn't been uh, uh, vociferously MAGA. Uh, and by the way, for good reason, he was threatened by Trump as well for not overturning the election in 2020. He was Trump's enemy number one. Mm -hmm. People forget that now. That is what Kemp has been able to do. He was in Trump's crosshairs immediately after 2020. And listen, Kemp gestures towards the MAGA people. But when he's in like um, a fundraiser, when he's in public spaces, it's the oh, I'm an aw shucks, Georgian, regular Republican. Mm -hmm. He knows how to code switch those things depending on times. He he weathered the storm of Trump. That is what is going to get him reelected. And Stacey Abrams, incredible organizer, incredible fundraiser. This is it's not going to happen. And, and I hate to be the person to tell you this. But, Nick, I will tell you, I think Warnock's going to pull this off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that Georgians are complicated voters. They really are. I think you're going to have a shit ton of Kemp Warnock voters. And I think it's going to be close. In fact, and I hate to say this, I think it could run, it could lead to a runoff in December. I think there's a real possibility that occurs. But my instinct right now with how this race has been run and the way that uh, it, it has moved, I actually think Stacey Abrams is going to help Warnock. And I think that people voting for Kemp and wanting to modulate their vote are going to vote for not Warnock. I think he wins. Mm -hmm. I think he I think he keeps that seat. Uh, yeah, and by complicated, you're right. We look at these numbers and you start breaking them out by by race, just because we. I, I I have to be a little cynical here. One of the reasons why they chose Walker, right, is because he's black, and they wanted to run and, a, in a in a statewide hero. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and they wanted to run against another black candidate. Um, yeah. and it's telling that of the black vote in Georgia, 92 percent are, are are favoring Warnock, right? Whereas Stacey yeah. Abrams actually got less than that. Which is another interesting thing that maybe speaks about women. You know what I mean? How we break that out. So um, I, I, I think you're right. I think Warnock wins. I think it's going to be crazy. But yes, you're going to have that split vote there. Um, and man, would it be suck if we have to deal with like Trump in the middle of his campaign all of a sudden, and then there's a, then there's a recount of uh, of the Senate race or something like that. That would be uh, horrible. Ooh. So let's just hope he can get a, you know a, a one percent high or more of our lead. Can I can I say one quick thing about the possibility of a runoff? Mm -hmm. Going back to the interview I did with the Democratic strategist consultant, James, there are so many people who are rooting for that, who know that Herschel Walker is a dangerous person and who know that like a runoff can go can break either way. Who, who the hell knows what's going to happen? There are tons of Democratic strategists who are like, yeah, get that runoff because they remember what happened in 2020. They remember how much money there was. You uh -huh. know, it just flooded into Georgia. And that's disgusting. I, in, in, in all of this, I think the uh, the political class has shown itself to be corrupted and decayed, and uh, I hope like hell they avoid a runoff. I, I hope that Warnock wins that in a walk. Can I can I jump in here for one quick second? Because of these of the top races across the country, there is a theme, uh, which is why I think we're both a little bit uh, pessimistic about winning yep. the House. 
And the theme is, there's a question they had on this poll, which was, um, you know, thinking about what, who you're going to vote for, what issues are most important to deciding your vote? And one was, you know, abortion, guns, and democracy. And the other side yep. was economics, economic issues. So the abortion thing was supposed to be catalyzing all everybody here. But you look across these states like Georgia and like um, Pennsylvania and where we were before in uh, Arizona. When you look at those, the women who favor issues like abortion, uh, it's only where is it? Um, 35 percent female in, in, for instance, in, uh, in Georgia feel like that's what's going to decide their vote. 35 percent. It doesn't get in, you know, higher than the 40s. Um, how you know this is this is a problem, right? We thought the women were going to come out and vote and, and and use this as their catalyst, and, and they are. But I don't think it's enough to sway you know or to hold back this red wave. I I want to say something, and I want to say it in the most judicious way that I possibly can, right? I, I, and I want people to take a walk with me for a second. This is always something that that turns a little contentious, but listen, we have to understand that it's true. There is a politics of performance where you and I can say what matters to us, right? Like what our principles are, what it is that we want to see in the world. You never know what those principles actually mean until they're tested, right? It costs nothing to sit there and say that the main driver is the idea that women should have bodily autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you're there and your pocketbook is in danger. The economy feels a little weird. Things feel like they're sort of swooning or in decline. All of a sudden then you have a choice, which is, do I care more about myself? And by the way, maybe you're a person who worries about your own bodily autonomy. Um, or maybe you live in Georgia where you don't expect abortion to necessarily be taken away full stop, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have to question, do I want to cast a vote for other people or do I want to cast a vote for myself? And the politics of selfishness in this country are, um, it's almost uncountable. You know what I mean? You can't, that's one of the reasons why polls don't necessarily work. And because you you have to you have to reckon with who you are and what you want and what you think and you think something about yourself that isn't always true you know mm -hmm. like there are a lot of people in blue states who can sit there and say that abortion's the number one thing but they're not going to have their rights taken away mm -hmm. right they that doesn't matter but then the message that something's going to happen economically or whatever it 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 turns into um it's a shadow game that we don't really appreciate, I don't think. The only problem I have with that is that it's not really apples to apples in a way that um, obviously everybody wants money. They want to be able to make more money, save more money, not pay yeah. taxes, have a better economy. Um, but it kind of comes down to the principle that it has nothing to do with whether you would get an abortion or not. This is all about you telling somebody else yep. in some other part of the land that they yep. can't do that. And yep. that's really, you know, such a strange concept to me, why I would be able to have any kind of power over someone like that. I mean, listen, we already have some basic laws in here that I think we can all agree with that everyone should be held to. But this is not one that, you know, and there's a couple of these hotspot issues like gay marriage that should not be. What does it matter if, you know, why should I be able to have dominion over somebody else on that? That's the problem here. I guess people would argue oh, that is democracy. But again, it's the mindset that you can. I can tell everybody else in the whole country that they cannot do what I think is an abomination. That is the thing I can't wrap my head around. So real fast before we move to Pennsylvania, Nick, what you, you think Warnock's going to win this? Do you think he wins it outright or do you think it's going to turn into a runoff? Uh, I feel like he can get more than 1% of a lead. I think so, too. I think I, so. It, I, he's just a terrible. Herschel Walker is just the absolute. If I and, and listen, I hardly ever do this. I hardly ever put a number on it. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go ahead and put this out there. And it doesn't matter. Listen. Prediction, the prediction business, I've said this before, you can be wrong on television every day for the rest of your life and they'll still have you on TV. But I'll go ahead and put this out there. My guess is Warnock wins it 53 to 47. That's my guess. Okay. That's them. I'll take it. I was thinking like maybe a point and a half, but okay. I, 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 I think... I think a lot of people are going to go to the polls and they're going to they're going to reject Herschel Walker. And and I could be wrong. I I, I, and I hope I'm not. But OK, so let's go to Pennsylvania. First of all, because we got to talk about the, the gubernatorial race and then we'll get into the the, the big one. Doug Mastriano, uh, I think, is going to get just absolutely beat to hell by Josh Shapiro. And I want to point out and this is important that we talk about this before the Senate race, because so many of these races are linked. Josh Shapiro is not a perfect candidate whatsoever. Uh, he has not run a perfect campaign. Doug Mastriano is one of the most abhorrent candidates that we have had this side of somebody who has been like accused of harassing young girls at malls. He is a disgusting person. 
And I and everything that I see shows that people have recognized that, which means I think Shapiro's going to win. I think he's going to win it handedly. That tells us, and this is going to be something we're going to be able to learn from the Fetter, the John Fetterman Mehmet Oz race. What happens in that race is going to tell us exactly how much the health thing mm -hmm. has played into this and how much the media narrative around it has played, and also ableism, straight up. Like, how is it that those voters are processing this thing? But I think Mastriano eats shit in this election, and rightfully so. He has earned it. And what happens then with Fetterman and Oz, I think is going to be sort of downstream from that. And we'll be, I think this actually, the results are going to be something that political scientists are going to be able to look at for a very long time. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of published articles and research on this. Sure. I mean, Mastriano has religious beliefs that will make <laughs> most religious people cringe as well. I mean, he's even gone over the board on that side. So he really is a terrible candidate. And it sucks that we have to even be in the situation where he gets to have a platform and, and run. But Yes, it, it, Pennsylvania is an interesting place, right? There are people who are, I mean, I don't know what the word is, but they're very uh, protective of their state yes. and their mindsets, right? And yes. again, Oz has been really beaten over the head of the fact that he doesn't really live in he the state. He doesn't really live there. <laughs> and that's a big one. I mean, and he continually makes the mistake. Did you see the thing where he said, you know, before the Steelers game tomorrow, call 10 people, and it turns out the Steelers have a buy, had a buy on oh, the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. So like, if, and if you don't know that, like that's a, that's a big affront to a, a, a state that's really into, into their sports. If this untalented elitist charlatan, who by the way, doesn't understand what Wawa and Sheets are about and doesn't understand like anything having to do with uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania culture. And you're exactly right. The, the, the people of Pennsylvania are very protective of their state. They love that state. They have their own weird culture. I love people from Pennsylvania. Keystoners are the best. They're so strange. If somehow or another Mehmet Oz squeaks this thing out, it says so much about what that stroke has meant, right? Um, and I got to tell you, and, and I'm going to be very honest with you, I have no idea what the hell is going to happen in this race. I don't, and, and none of the none of the polls or trajectories or any of that, I think, tell us what's going to happen in this race. But I will say, and I hate to say it, Americans uh, make bad decisions quite a lot of the time. I really don't want to think that Oz pulls this off, but it worries me. I'll just say that. Yeah. I mean, again, especially because Pennsylvania is another one of those Rust Belt states that's going to be really uh, key to 2024. And again, the prism isn't like, oh, you know, it's, God darn it, Republican won. This is, oh shit, Republican won, and they're going to change the votes and send new electors to the Electoral College. And that's this really is, the problem. This is the big enchilada. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I think down down ballot, like the other, there's there's other local races that are going to be also uh, affecting these the, the votes in 2024. So we got to make sure you get as many of these Democrats in the top spots as they possibly can. So what's your feeling on this one? Oh, so I, I think I, I feel good about Fetterman, even though I mean I don't feel great about Fetterman because he you know, he, he had to have a stroke of all things. This is going to be the one thing. Otherwise, he would have won by 12 points. Like he I was, he would have destro destroyed him. So and I and I, I'm I feel perfectly fine having seen him since the stroke, uh, and despite needing you know uh, uh, what's it uh, closed captions. So what? It's like having a hearing aid or whatever. That's that doesn't that didn't affect me at all. I feel like his his mind can function well enough uh, to to uh, you know uh, be in the Senate. Um, so I, I feel good about him. And then yeah, I, I think Mastriano is still. He's just you know it, 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 maybe in a in the next governor's race. Maybe he could win. You know what I mean? I don't know if we're going somewhere different, but it, it still seems like, at least for Pennsylvania, there is some semblance of normalcy where he is just too extreme and he's not going to get you know within five points. Yeah, I agree. And and if if Shapiro walks away from this thing and or walks away from Mastriano and Fetterman goes down, I mean, what a commentary. I that I, I will say, and I know that this isn't like some sort of breaking news or whatever. Tomorrow night when we're, or I guess it's tonight when people are listening to this. This is this is probably the race I'm watching as much as any other, right? I think it's a real bellwether, which you know Pennsylvania always is. Um, another race I'm going to be watching simply because of personal uh, uh, dislike for one of the candidates. We got to go over to Ohio. I'm going to say this. J.D. Vance against Tim Ryan. I have enjoyed greatly watching Tim Ryan beat the shit out of J.D. Vance and pull his pants down on the stage everywhere he goes and expose him. Um, I hate J.D. Vance. I think he is a class trader. 
I think he is a grifter. I think he is a dangerous person. Um, Nick, I also think he's going to be the next senator from Ohio. I'm sorry, J.D. Vance was going to be? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's funny because I was thinking uh, I had lost track of the polls for a little while, but I just you know, did real, real uh, clear politics. Yeah, he's up big. He's up big. Um, I, I didn't realize that. You know what? I, I, I should have been paying attention to that poll itself because I'm just so overwhelmed by how bad uh, Vance has been. Although, to, in some respects, Vance has kind of quieted down and spoke less in the last He's little He's done minute. nothing. Yeah. And, nothing. and so that, that kind of helps him, right? The, more, the yes. less you speak when you're like you're such a bad candidate. The maybe the When you're detestable. Is. Yeah. You know, yeah. when your face makes people physically ill, it's better not to go out in public. You know, uh, I noticed you didn't say you like anybody from Ohio like you did for Pennsylvania. <laughs> I like Ohio fine. It's a border state with Indiana. You know how it goes. You got to have a little bit of problems. But I will say, I think Tim Ryan has done the best with what he's been given. J.D. Vance is, ba I mean, Ohio, Ohio's not a toss up state anymore. It's just not. The Democratic Party failed in Ohio. I mean, and anybody in the Democratic Party you talk to, strategies, comms, fundraising, they know that they failed there. And, and a lot of people have given up on it completely. Uh, J.D. Vance is an awful, detestable candidate. He's had a ton of money from Peter Thiel flowing in. Of course, McConnell has wanted that seat. He's more than fine with it. I will say this. If we're broadcasting tomorrow and this race doesn't get called very quickly, mm -hmm. that speaks to something larger. That speaks to the possibility that a lot of these numbers, a lot of these expectations could very well be off. I'll just say that. Okay. Now, let's not forget, I think I quickly mentioned earlier, though, that whatever the polls that have been flooding uh, from the GOP um, in here, again, are just going to be used as more evidence for them that there is these po that the elections are fraudulent. Yes. And um, and you have to worry about that, you know, in all of these races, especially like, I, I, you know, I simply, in theory, Ohio won't have to deal with that. But that is a thing uh, that just frightens me, because if these polls are way off like that, then that's just going to, you know, it's I'm telling you, it's a tipping off point for weeks yep. of just chaos. And who knows how these are going to result. Even if the Republicans uh, sweep control of Congress by like record numbers, they're still going to say there was fraud. It's 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 the biggest golden ticket that you can keep in your pocket. It's it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of this stuff, I'm I'm sorry, but we're not going to know the results of some of this stuff for a couple of weeks. We just aren't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I. So are you with me? You think Vance probably gets this? Yeah, he looks like it. So uh, I've yeah. never had a personal enemy in the Senate. <laughs> <I've> never... <laughs> wow. I've never had a personal enemy of mine in the Senate. I do not look forward to that possibility. I'll yeah. say that. All right. He's a detestable person. And the fact that he is this close to the reins of power, I think it just speaks um, incredible volumes of where this country is at this moment. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, yeah. All right. Let's head on down to Florida. Speaking of terrible people. Listen, Ron DeSantis is going to beat Charlie Crist. Charlie Crist has been an absolute embarrassment, but I needed to talk about something. Um, Nick, can you very, very quickly, can you give the people like a little bit of a taste of this new Ron DeSantis propaganda that is uh, circulating? And by the way, for anybody who doesn't know this, and, and we'll talk more about it, it spawned a Trump nickname that we have to discuss. And I got to tell you, it's a little, uh, it's a little lacking. And on the eighth day... God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. <laughs> God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, kiss his family goodbye, travel thousands of miles for no other reason than to serve the people, to save their jobs, their livelihoods, their liberty, their happiness. Now, the, if you haven't seen this, this is a new ad put out by the Ron DeSantis campaign, and it is it basically is pictures of Ron DeSantis as this voice, which is, um, you know, sort of plagiarizing the God made a farmer speech that is pretty iconic for some people. Uh, basically, it's suggesting that God created Ron DeSantis to protect the people and to protect the country, which is incredible. And, and if this is any indication, that and his Top Gun bullshit that he did about, like, fighting the media and flying in jet planes, if that's any indication of what a Ron DeSantis presidential campaign would look like, I'm tired already, man. Oh, lots of cosplay for him. Yeah, you know, he is – by the way, I just read an article about him as a teacher. Do you know he was a teacher for out of Yale? Uh, Yale? How – okay, first of all, I know we had to do an election preview show. 
How have we not talked about that article yet? <laughs> it is a problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was teaching in the South at a really nice boarding school in Georgia, right? And and yep. uh, basically yep. was, it sounds to me like he was uh, Civil War denying. <laughs> he, went, he went out, he was talking about how the Civil War was about property, which it was, but that also obscures what that property was which is human beings right so he did that also and and if you want to know who ron DeSantis is it's like all the students are like i don't know he just kept showing up at all of our parties Mm -hmm. and uh i we don't have to say anything else because this is a podcast that doesn't want to get sued you know into the earth but yeah that's interesting yeah well and then the next year they had instituted a new rule it said teachers couldn't fraternize with the uh high schoolers and uh everyone was like yeah that's that's the DeSantis rule and every time that he was in the classroom, he talked about how the job wasn't good enough for him and he was destined to be a political leader, possibly even the president. This person is deranged and dangerous. Mm-hmm. And we know that, but this is further proof. I, I, I wish we could do a couple hours just on that, just well, on that article. Wild. Yeah. But Donald Trump, who has set his sights on DeSantis as he's getting ready to launch his uh, new campaign, uh, he went after Ronnie Donnie and uh, he called him Ron De sanctimonious. I got to tell you, I don't know who Donald Trump is talking to these days. Somebody needs to get in his ear and tell him to go back to the workshop. That ain't going to cut it. Yeah, they need to workshop that again. Uh, yeah, but and, and you know, but it's not and there's not it's not hard. You'll be able to find some other things that they can do uh, for with that name. <laughs> I'm sure we, <laughs> you got to you got to do something else that ain't doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a personality thing, right? A lot of times, again, until we get to robots where there is no personality and it's just a rubber stamp for the party, we still have these people who think that they need to be, need to have a certain you know uh, mindset or certain personality to to do the, this job. You know, Matt Gates is in that same. It's 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 a um, personality. I can't call it disorder. It's a personality trait, I suppose, or style. You know, there, there, there's a similarity there, and um, it, it it's so off putting. But like, give me some inf- insight because obviously people rally to this guy. There's something in, in, you know uh, enticing about that. I it's immediate when I see him speak that I can't take it. But what is it? Nobody capitalized off of the pandemic more than him. That's what it was. He was the first person who came out of the gates and said, I'm not doing this. I don't care how many people die. This is what we're doing. He then became a conservative icon. And and basically what happened is that was his audition for all of the ideologues, plus also the infrastructure of the party. And by he basically, because Trump, we talked about this mm-hmm. on the podcast, Trump knocked everything down to the state level. And DeSantis was like, absolutely, I'll take it. Yeah, give me all the power you want to give me. And he made himself there. Uh, Abbott, and by the way, we're not going to talk about the Texas race. Beto's going to lose. Right. That's going to happen. Um, it, it, and by the way, if you just want to understand what's going on there, t- take a look at the Stacey Abrams part that we already talked about. It's more or less, you know, similar. Um, and, and with DeSantis, he took control. I will say to put this, um, because, you know, it was like we talked about this during the conventions. We talked about sort of the quiet parts of politics that you know if you're on the inside tomorrow night go ahead and put this on your calendar DeSantis will win this race early uh my guess is the networks will call it 9 15 9 30 pretty quick DeSantis will give a speech before prime time is over we will watch that on our show right and what we're going to watch, and, and this is what experts like this do, a governor who overperforms or wins handedly, who has desires for the White House, their victory speech is a preview of the early workings of the presidential campaign. So what we might watch tomorrow, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, that Trump might announce either tonight or tomorrow, except for the fact he's a narcissist, is you are probably going to get the launching of the Ron DeSantis presidential campaign. Not officially. But the rollout of it, that'll probably happen tomorrow while we're broadcasting. OK, well, let's let's put on our hats then, because there's going to be some keywords, right, that must yep. come out of that speech that would signify that at uh, anything. I don't want to put you in the spot, but I feel like uh, you might have some ideas. Yeah. So one of the things that it's, it's going to be about strength, it's going to be about needing. And, and by the way, I like I don't want to give Ron DeSantis anything approaching free advice. But if anybody around him is worth a shit, they would focus on serious leadership. Uh, 
like the 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 woke left is is threatening your children they're coming after your jobs they're coming after your careers they're coming after your um uh your good name you need a serious conservative in there Mm -hmm. and that right there it goes ahead and says that he is above the trumpian sideshow circus that's what that's what he should do if he has instincts or if people around him have instincts we'll see what happens but but i also think he'll probably try and dunk on california a hundred percent because he also might sense that gavin newsom might want to move in on this turf as well and run absolutely absolutely i i think you're exactly right um i think probably take some shots at california uh, depending upon what's happening in these other states, if anybody like, you know, if we like Pennsylvania, right, if Josh Shapiro wins immediately, like before DeSantis does or around the same time, maybe you take a shot at him. You start bringing into the alliances. There's a lot of stuff they can have. But tomorrow night um, is probably the spiritual beginning of Ron DeSantis 2024. Yeah. So I, and, and what, so the, the point we're making is you'll hear national uh, stuff that talks about the whole country versus just what he could do for Florida, which is yes. nothing. Yes, exactly. He'll he'll roll out his vision of the Republican Party. And and that noise you'll hear will be basically every Republican who doesn't have like a Trump tattoo on their lower back screaming out in, you know, glorious agony is what you'll hear. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a much worse uh, inappropriate. I, what I, and by the way, I want to go ahead and put this bug in your ear. We're going to watch the Ron DeSantis speech and then I want you to immediately put it on Fox News and basically watching these people just like blissing out. <laughs> <laughs> that because that's where it's going to happen. Yep. All right. Well, what's what's our next race? We got to go to Wisconsin. I, I got to tell you, everybody, Ron Johnson, who is another detestable, unlikable asshole. He is going to beat Mandela Barnes. And I, I don't know what else to tell you. It's unfortunate. Uh, the Democrats should have picked up the seat. Should have. But they're not going to. Um, you know, he, Mandela Barnes is a, is a troubled candidate. And uh, yep. I was in Wisconsin uh, last month. And, uh, you know, it, at the bars, like it was nonstop, never ending attack ads against him. Yep. It was crazy. Yep. It was almost literally like every ad uh, in yep. between, uh, you know, Sports Center, whatever it was, uh, was, was a, just an attack ad. And, uh, you know, he did OK, and, but he has a troubled history as well. And it, it was it was going to be an uphill battle. And I, it's unbelievable that a guy because Ron Johnson is is theoretically as bad as like Herschel Walker in my mind. Well, so a real fast, and I just want to go ahead and beat this drum because it's important. And and everybody has been saying to me, they're like, why don't you believe the hype about the idea that the Democrats keep both the House and the Senate, right? This race right here is tailor made for the Democrats to win. Ron Johnson's detestable, unlikable, doesn't have really anything even approaching skills. The state doesn't even really like him. Mandela Barnes is not a good candidate, but if it's a movement election, what you need is a party platform. We keep talking about this. What does what does being a Democrat stand for as opposed to not being a Republican? Right. Mm. Okay. you need more representatives. What are you going to give me? The Democrats have not given that to anybody. They haven't said like how they would codify Roe. They haven't said how they would change the economy. They haven't said shit. Mandela Barnes is the type of candidate that a party program would drag over the finish line. It's not going to happen. And that, I think, tells us everything about what's going on in this election. Right. I mean, the fact that it's as close as it is, you know, three points, four points, whatever it is, is a testament to how bad Ron Johnson is, I think, yes. versus anything else. And you know, let's not forget, Wisconsin is Madison and Milwaukee are the, the two bastions of, of, uh, of, of leftism. Yep. But once you get out of there, it gets radical really fast. And we see, you know, militias and we see way out in the woods, people who are just, you know, are rural, you know, deep red Republicans. And it's really uh, it didn't used to be that way. Wisconsin was was pretty blue, I think, for a long time. Yeah, I got to check that, but I'm pretty sure it was. And so um, nonetheless, uh, you know, this is where we're moving towards. And uh, it's it's that's one of the seats that really was ripe. And and I can't believe they couldn't have done a better job on that. Listen, I don't want to give everybody like an overdue history lesson. But one of the reasons 2016 turned out the way it did was because the Democratic firewall fell apart. And it fell apart because the Democratic Party uh, basically took for granted uh, its old constituency. They thought they didn't have to worry about labor unions. They didn't have to worry about working class people. And as a result, Michigan went, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. The fact that they and, – and Ohio, by the way, they, they just said goodbye, Ohio. We don't need you, right? You want to talk about J.D. Vance. It is the collapse of the Democratic new coalition. That's what's happened. The Democrats have taken – 
for granted a lot of voters that they're losing. The Republican Party, by the way, for people, I, and, and listen, I know our listeners aren't siloed people. I know they're interested. I know they look beyond just sort of like standard sort of things. The Republican Party is making inroads not just with traditional Democratic voters in those circles. They're making inroads with uh, black voters. They're making inroads with Hispanic voters. Like those types of things are happening because the Democratic Party has lost its bearings and it has become reactionary as opposed to, uh, um, you know, uh, productive. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem. And that is why we, we don't even have to talk about what's happening in Wisconsin. Well, I mean, we, we kind of need to do it in the sense that that was ground zero for where they wanted to try and disenfranchise as many people in a very systematic way f from yep. 12 years ago going back. So, oh, and by the way, all of it was right wing donor money that made it happen. Mm -hmm. Scott Walker was not a good politician. It was Coke money. Mm -hmm. that went in there. That's yeah. exactly what happened. And as a result, you have like the governor, uh, the guy running for governor, Tim Michaels, who's basically saying, if I win, a, a Republican will never lose another Senate, another race again. And they are able to change the constitution of the state itself to basically manipulate these these ballots from now on. And they, they could probably do that. And then, by the way, it wouldn't stop other states from trying to do this as well. That's yeah. the scary thing. So Wisconsin is going to be uh, on a local level, a, a ground zero for a really problematic thing in terms of if we're talking about, you know, we're so scared for democracy as a whole. What, what they can do in Wisconsin, if he if they if the governor wins for the Republicans, uh, could very well be a blueprint for a lot of other states. And that would just be, you know, there goes democracy uh, again. Exactly. And by the way, this conversation that we're having about why this has happened and, and what we're sort of taking a look at, this is the reason why we even have to talk about the governor race in New York. I mean, my God, Nick, my God. The incumbent governor of New York is going to get reelected. Lee Zeldin very well could like lose by maybe three or four points. The Republican nominee in New York, they're send. I'm sorry, but the Democratic Party is sending heavy hitters mm -hmm. into New York and New Hampshire. Like that's a sign. Something has to shift. And 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 I'll go ahead and I'll say, after all this conversation, everything that we've talked about, I I I do feel like the Republicans are going to win the House and the Senate. I think that's what's going to happen. You know, maybe I'm wrong and I hope that I'm wrong and maybe something goes one way or the other. But Nick, the determining factor of the next two years is whether or not Joe Biden and whether or not the Democratic Party with their backs against the wall can do something better than what they're doing now. And I haven't I, I've seen little glimpses of it here and there that they can. But uh, the jury still remains out because a, a Republican controlled Congress, along with re Republican controlled legislatures in the states, Republican controlled Supreme Court, that's a recipe for disaster. And you have to basically spend the next two years making the argument, this is a mess. This is an absolute crisis. How do we put it right? Here's where we go. And I don't know yet what that looks like. Yeah, I, I don't know if the Senate's going to go because I, I believe that Fetterman and um, Warnock are going to win. Yep. And if they can get those two, it kind of feels like they could at the very least be another 50-50. So, Maybe. Um, you know, but then you're right, uh, because Vance is going to win and then you have a real problem in Arizona. Uh, but but let's just, I mean, obviously, if if Arizona goes Democrat, then I really feel good about them having, you know, having control of the Senate. So and by the, the way, if watch. that's the trend, mm -hmm. if that's the trend is Republican governor, Democratic senator. Yeah, that is a fascinating glimpse into the electorate. You know what I mean? That's not sustainable, that is, right? Do what? That's not sustainable, right? That's no, <laughs> no, that is not sustainable at all. So that, uh, yeah, that's not. That speaks to like a real fissure. And and it, by the way, the American elector has done done dumb shit for years, Nick. We know that. I mean, like the idea of divided government has always been so stupid. But like that sort of move to have states that are controlled by Republican ideology, but sending people to Washington D.C. who are Democrats, it speaks to a misunderstanding of how politics works, but also really misplaced priorities. I'll just say that. So you're talking about Elon Musk tweeting today how he thinks everyone should vote Republican to have a balanced government. Did he do that? You didn't I see didn't. that? Here's a guy who's the owner, owner of the most influential social media platform of all times, and he's literally weighing in the day before the election, and he says, it's much better when you have like a Democratic White House and the Republican uh, you know, Senate or Congress. Now, you tell me, by him doing that, you mm. convince me that he's not a puppet of Putin. Oh, God. Or China, or, or Saudi Arabia, or, or, or all of those. I can't see how he is anything other than a, 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 a sowing discord 
you know, and trying to create more chaos, uh, which is Putin's agenda. I, I can't see any other role that he would have. I didn't know he did that. Yeah, it was just like that. Just made me feel very sick. Man, he sucks. Yeah, and, and I won't tell you how many likes that tweet got because it got a lot. I assume it did. I it Nick, it's that. And then by the way, like the fact that we haven't talked about Musk and Twitter, basically that needs to be in every conversation we have about politics right now. Like it does. It 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 defines so much. Um, I mean. All of this is happening at the exact same time. The conversations I'm having with other experts and, and uh, analysts, uh, analysts, like it is, um, it's grim, and and the Twitter part is a major component of it. I mean, the fact that they like completely dismantled their like misinformation teams, like everything around elections and foreign interference. Um, I talked to one person today uh, in the know who told me that the flow of bots and misinformation campaigns from both Russia and Russian affiliated groups, uh, what's going on right now makes 2016 just look like a tea party. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's just full bore. It's it's pedal to the metal. And I'm sure you saw that, you know, a lot of people they fired. They were like, um, whoops, can you can you come back? Um, they, they, they misfired <laughs> a whole bunch of people uh, in different groups of, of uh, programs they've wanted to continue to develop. And they had fired the entire team on those projects. So uh, this is not a smart person. This is not a person who knows how to manage anything. And a pathetic person. Mm -hmm. A pathetic person. The way he is wielding power so far is um, not just troubling. It's 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 really repulsive. He's a troubled, troubled person. And uh, the fact that he has this much power and sway, I think, is terrible. Um, but that being said, listen, I, I want to go ahead and make the case. And, and this is something we've talked about in this podcast before. This what we do. And what people like democracy -ish do as well. There, there aren't many of us. There aren't many podcasts who I would say, Nick, people get into the minutia of things, but they kind of shy away from like the harder realities of it. You know what I mean? Like, unfortunately, like there are harder realities we have to deal with. I'll, I'll say this tomorrow night uh, or tonight when you're listening to this on Tuesday is going to be a tough night. It just is. There's no way. And even if the Democrats somehow or another pull, you know, victory from the jaws of defeat, the coverage of it, the normalization of candidates like Walker and Vance and all these people, it doesn't go away. Um, this is going to be hard. I, I would recommend um, I, I, I think people should come out. I think they should watch our coverage starting at 8 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday night because we're going to be having conversations that other people are not and maybe they're not capable of. I don't know how you feel about that. It's like they've shown themselves incapable or unwilling, and I, I, I don't have much room for that anymore. I don't know about you. Uh, you don't have enough, enough, much room for people who are incapable of having that discussion? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. Uh, right. You want to have discussions with people who, who can think deeply, right, and, and have <laughs> empathy. Listen, we're not going to have an 18-person panel, and we're not going to have holograms that, you know, Wolf Blitzer is going to walk into, but... Uh, yeah, I, I hope you all can come out. That is 8 p.m. Eastern this Tuesday night uh, for the midterm elections. I don't know. how. What, what, we haven't talked about this. This is actually pulling back the curtain. How long are we going? What are we doing tomorrow? Oh, geez, Louise. Well, it's early for me, at least. So, you know, uh, it's probably more up to you, I guess, how, how long. But, you know, probably like two, couple, two three hours. Four, okay. I know, right? I'm, I, listen, I'm in, man. I'm, I'm ready to do this. This is this is what we're made for. This is what we do this for. So hopefully we see you 8 p.m. Eastern. We're putting it on the YouTube channel. Uh, I will tweet out links. Nick will tweet out links. We'll send it out to the uh, the Discord. We'll send it out to the Patreon. All that good stuff. Uh, if you haven't already, go over to patreon.com slash podcast to support the cast. People are doing it more and more because they know that they that this is stuff that they need and this is a show that needs it. It keeps us editorially independent, having real actual conversations. Patreon.com slash podcast. We will see you tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern. YouTube channel. Check it out. And yes, before then, you can find Nick at Can You Hear Me SMH. You can find me at JY Sexton. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>